Thank you, Dr. Schauer, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm pretty low tech, so hopefully I can. Oh, sorry. The, the one with the big sign that says forward on it. Um, my only disclosure is that I am an employee of the American Diabetes Association. I have no other financial conflicts of interest. Um, just briefly wanted to tell you um, who the American Diabetes Association is. Um, we've been around for um, over 60 years. Um, we're a voluntary health uh, organization. We're not a provider organization. We basically um, support people with diabetes through funding diabetes research, uh, information, and advocacy. We provide, um, that's actually a typo, about $40 million per year in research funding. Um, through a peer-reviewed um, process. And we have a website. We have a very busy call center that people that want information about diabetes can call. Um, we publish um, a consumer magazine, um, books. Uh, we have all kinds of programs for people with diabetes, um, everything from uh, summer camps for children with diabetes to large health fairs. Um, but we also have a scientific and medical division, which is where I'm based, um, and we have professional journals, books, continuing medical education, as well as um, our guidelines, which we call clinical practice recommendations. <clears throat> our primary guideline is our standards of medical care uh, in diabetes. It's updated yearly and published in January in Diabetes Care. And our guidelines are developed and updated by a multidisciplinary committee, um, primarily based on um, the published evidence. Um, and when we update them every year, we try to incorporate any new evidence since the prior version. Um, diabetes care has become um, quite complicated. The first standards of care that the ADA published was in 1989. At that point, it was four pages long in the journal and had 10 references. Um, and this, the one that just came out in January uh, was 51 pages long and had 410 references. Um, so perhaps if surgery becomes the magic bullet for diabetes, we can go back to the shorter um, version. Um, we do uh, rate our recommendations based on the evidence, and I won't go through all this, um, just to say that, um, that A level is based on the highest level of, of evidence, um, randomized controlled trials, multi-center trials, and so forth. B level evidence is more based on um, well, um, high quality um, cohort or observational data. C level recommendations are based on conflicting data or um, rather poor quality data. Um, and then we, we also have E-level recommendations, which are based on expert consensus or clinical experience. Um, so what are the, um, the ADA uh, recommendations regarding bariatric surgery for people with diabetes? Um, the first is that bariatric surgery should be considered for adults uh, with a BMI of, um, should be greater than or equal to 35 and type 2 diabetes. Um, especially if the diabetes or associated comorbidities are difficult to control with lifestyle and pharmacologic therapy. And that's a B-level uh, recommendation um, because it's primarily based on the um, meta-analyses, meta-analysis of um, primarily cohort data um, that's been discussed before. Um, I should say that it's, it says especially just meaning uh, to really highlight to clinicians um, that that people um, that have difficult to control diabetes or comorbidities are ones in whom the clinicians should really consider this. Um, it doesn't mean that it's only, um, only those patients in whom it should be considered. The second recommendation is um, regarding uh, patients with BMI of less than 35. Um, and it's a, we say that although small trials have shown glycemic benefit of surgery, in patients with type 2 diabetes and BMI of 30 to 35, there's currently insufficient evidence to generally recommend surgery in patients with a BMI less than 35 outside of a research protocol. Um, generally recommended just means we wouldn't say recommend it to everybody. Um, obviously, there may be specific instances when, when a clinician might recommend it. Um, the Dixon randomized controlled trial that several people have already mentioned um, did include uh, patients with BMIs between 30 and 40, uh, but only 13 of those 60 patients had a BMI of less than 35. So there still um, remains um, what you know, we felt to be insufficient evidence. I'll, I'll be very interested to read 
um, some of the studies that were mentioned earlier that have just been presented at meetings uh, when those have actually come out. The other, another recommendation is that patients with type 2 diabetes who have undergone bariatric surgery need lifelong lifestyle support and medical monitoring, um, expert consensus, um, and I think this is just common sense that, it, that we would all agree on um, because of issues of weight regain, uh, vitamin and mineral uh, deficiencies, potentially uh, osteoporosis, and the, the rare cases of post-surgery uh, severe hypoglycemia. And then finally, in terms of um, recommendations uh, for uh, research agenda, the long-term benefits, cost-effectiveness, and risks of surgery in individuals with type 2 diabetes should be studied in well-designed randomized control trials with optimal medical and lifestyle therapy as the comparator. Um, most of the trials have not been randomized controlled trials. Um, the Dixon randomized controlled trial did have a lifestyle group as a comparator, but um, I don't think that most of us would define 1.7% uh, body weight loss as, as really optimal therapy. Um, there are um, trials going on of, of diet and lifestyle changes, um, including the Look Ahead trial, which is a major long-term cardiovascular outcome trial in type 2 diabetes uh, with weight loss. And um, the one-year follow-up of the look-ahead um, subjects shows very impressive um, reductions in blood pressure, glucose, um, increases in HDL cholesterol with uh, lifestyle therapy, but you do have to uh, put a lot of resources into it. Um, lifestyle counseling and support is generally not well uh, reimbursed in this country, and so um, just, it, you know, the, the idea is if you really put equal resources into lifestyle therapy um, that are put into surgery, that that would be um, a good comparison. What else is ADA doing? Um, since it was so quick for me to present our guidelines, I wanted to just briefly mention what else uh, we're doing in this space of uh, bariatric or metabolic surgery. We do have a consumer magazine, so we're doing a little um, direct-to-consumer uh, marketing, I guess. Um, the cover article of the March um, issue of this magazine was on uh, weight loss surgery. Um, it, about half a million people subscribed to this magazine. We also, um, last year, uh, convened a little consensus group um, to discuss what constitutes a cure of diabetes. Um, this wasn't uh, purely talking about um, surgery, but also issues like transplantation, islet cell transplants for, for patients with type 1 diabetes, the artificial pancreas, um, and um, uh, weight loss uh, through lifestyle um, measures and and how do we what do we call people whose glucose levels um, have normalized with those so we had a, a very multidisciplinary group that worked on this including um, Francesca Rubino um, some transplant people we actually had a hematology oncology um, specialist because we we thought of some of the the um, analogies with um, some forms of cancer in terms of partial and complete remissions um, we're, we're also um, obviously very interested in the, the science behind um, the surgery and the, and the mechanistic um, issues. At our scientific sessions last year, we had a symposium on metabolic surgery. Um, this year, we're, we're not having a specific symposium, but I just looked at the program, and there are multiple presentations sort of scattered throughout the, uh, the program on everything from mechanisms to psychosocial aspects to the role of exercise post-surgery. Um, and then finally, um, w our research um, foundation is having discussions with a potential um, donor or sponsor um, about um, providing us with funds so that we can have an RFA, RFA to seek um, grant applications for clinical studies uh, related to bariatric and metabolic surgery and diabetes. So that's kind of a quick overview of, of ADA and what we're doing in this space. And I just wanted to close with this slide that I think um, kind of contrasts the relationships of adverse body weight with diabetes and how they've changed um, in the past century. So on the left is an extremely underweight uh, child with type 1 diabetes prior to the um, discovery of insulin, uh, which, um, as many of you may know, uh, one of the two co-discoverers was a surgeon, Fred Banting. 
Um, and then the bottom picture is the same child three months after the initiation of insulin therapy. And then on the right, we have uh, 90 years later and um, the more common um, adverse um, <laughs> relationship of body weight to diabetes. And I just thought this was a striking image, but uh, thank you very much.